Hi, I'm Brad Sobolewski, one of your emergency medicine attendings. This section of board review focuses on toxicology and environmental exposures. The majority of accidental exposures in children are non-pharmaceuticals. The peak age for unintentional ingestions is 18 months to three years. Initial management is always ABCs, get a glucose, an EKG, a urine drug screen is rarely if ever helpful, but we still get it. Physical exam can offer clues, especially the pupils. So cholinergics and clonidine, opiates and organophosphates, fencyclidine, phenothiazine, pilocarpine, and the sedatives such as barbiturates make up the mnemonic COPS, which cause meiosis or tiny pupils. The most common one is definitely opiates. Medriasis or big pupils are seen in AAS, so anticholinergics such as atropine, antihistamines, and sympathomimetics like amphetamine, cocaine, and LSD. So what are the classic signs of anticholinergic poisoning? You all know this. Dry as a bone, red as a beet, hot as a hair, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter. You have dry, flush skin and dry mucous membranes. Patients are hypothermic, they have medriasis. They're agitated, delirious, they have hallucinations. They're tachycardic and they are hypertensive. Patients can have urinary retention and decreased bowel sounds, even coma or seizures. Antihistamines are the most common that you'll see. TCAs may happen, but they may not have the pupil findings. Uh, physostigmine is short-lived and more useful for differentiating what toxicity is going on rather than treatment. So what are the classic signs of cholinergic poisoning? Dumbbells. These are patients where things are leaking out of everything. Defecation, urination, meiosis, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, and bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. Muscarinic and nicotinic receptors are affected. Treatment is the ABCs, decon, atropine, pralidoxime, which hydrolyzes the bond on cholinergic receptors before it becomes permanent. Classic story would be organophosphates, insecticides, and nicotine. So think the kid exposed to pesticides after they uh, dumped pesticides all over a farm. So what are the classic signs of opioid poisoning? CNS depression, meiosis, respiratory depression or apnea, bradycardia, and hypotension. Note that clonidine can produce a similar picture. The treatment for opiate poisoning is Narcan. You can use a bigger dose or a smaller dose depending on whether or not the patient's apneic. How about sympathomimetic poisoning? Agitation, tremors, hallucinations, seizures, tachycardia, hypertension, medriasis, diaphoresis, everything is ramped up. Examples of these include decongestants such as pseudoephedrine, also cocaine and amphetamines. Which poisoning classically has a prolonged QRS? TCAs. That shows up on tests. You'll see tachycardia including sinus tach and ventricular arrhythmias, hypotension, although sometimes patients are mildly hypertensive initially, wide QRS, prolonged QTC, and conduction delays. CCA is a good way to remember TCA symptoms, coma, convulsions, cardiac dysrhythmias, and acidosis. So which ingestions are radiopaque on x-ray? Well, calcium, heavy metals, iron, phenothiazines, and terracotta tablets and salicylates. Iron shows up most frequently on the boards. For which drugs and agents is activated charcoal ineffective? Well, you can use the mnemonic chemical camp. So caustics, hydrocarbons like tiki torch oil, electrolytes, metals, iron, cyanide, alcohols, lithium, camphor, and phosphorus. Tylenol or acetaminophen ingestions are incredibly common to see on the boards. The minimal toxic dose in a child less than 12 years of age is 150 milligrams per kilogram or more. Adolescents and adults, it's seven and a half grams. Remember, there's different stages of toxicity. Stage one, between zero and 24 hours, there's usually no symptoms. You get occasional nausea and vomiting, but normal transaminases. 24 to 72 hours later, you get right upper quadrant pain, the liver transaminases begin to increase, you get a prolonged PT, elevated INR, which indicates synthetic liver dysfunction. Some have abnormal renal or pancreatic function as well at this point. Stage three, which is 72 to 96 hours, are the peak of symptoms. You have fulminant hepatic failure, coagulopathy, and multi-system organic failure. Stage four is four to 14 days later, Patients either recover or they don't. Symptoms can resolve in survivors, and this is still one of the leading causes of liver transplant. So in acetaminophen ingestion, if the ingestion is massive and timing unknown, start N-acetylcysteine. 
give activated charcoal for less than 90 minutes and get a four hour acetaminophen level. That's the most useful for treatment because you want to treat ideally within the first six to eight hours. If you're going to see the Rumac Matthew nomogram, then you'll have to use it. Treat with NAC oral or IV, the latter is better tolerated. Benefit is greatest in the first eight hours and the main risk of NAC treatment is anaphylaxis. Salicylate injections are less seen uh, clinically than acetaminophen, but still very testable. Aspirin, over-the-counter cold medicines, antidiarrheals, herbal preparations, bithymus of salicylate, and oil of wintergreen all contain salicylates. Now the toxicity is much more rarely seen, uh, but generally if you get 500 milligrams per kilogram into your body, it, you can, it can kill you. What early symptom is most specific? This is testable, tinnitus. So early on, you'll see that tinnitus, fever, nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. Major systems affected include GI, respiratory, uh, metabolic with acidosis, and hypo or hyperglycemia, and CNS with agitation, confusion, and coma. The classic blood gas pattern is respiratory alkalosis plus metabolic acidosis. You have an uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, which causes a high anion gap in metabolic acidosis. Electrolytes can show high or low glucose, hypokalemia, and acidosis. The salicylate level in the serum may correlate with level of toxicity. If it's between 30 and 50, potentially they're toxic. 50 to 100, they're usually symptomatic. Greater than 100 indicates serious CNS or respiratory toxicity is likely. Treatment is alkalinization with sodium bicarbonate, which traps salicylates in the blood and the renal tubule, reducing toxicity and enhancing elimination. Aim for a urine pH greater than 7.5 with a serum pH no higher than 7.55. Hemodialysis is indicated for severe cases. Ibuprofen ingestions are rarely harmful. Less than 200 milligram per kilogram probably doesn't cause toxicity, but greater than 400 milligram per kilogram can co cause severe injury. Symptoms generally occur within four hours of ingestion and resolve within 24 hours. Nausea, vomiting, and epigastric discomfort. Serious complications are fortunately rare, which include anion gap metabolic acidosis, renal failure, and coma. The antihypertensives are dangerous. This includes beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and clonidine. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and diuretics are less often seen, though they can still cause hypotension. So beta blockers, you're symptomatic within two to six hours. You get bradycardia, hypotension, and hypoglycemia. Sotolol can precipitate torsades. Calcium channel blockers are very, very dangerous. They can cause bradycardia and hypotension. Treatment of those is ABC, isotonic fluid boluses, IV calcium gluconate to overcome the cardiac effects, IV glucagon that can help increase heart rate by increasing intracellular levels of cyclic AMP, IV high dose insulin and glucose, the mechanism is incompletely understood but it does help, vasopressors, and IV lipid emulsion which can act as a lipid sink surrounding drug molecules and serve as an energy source for the myocardium. Clonidine behaves a little bit like opiates and causes bradycardia, hypotension, and hypopnea. It may respond to Narcan, but honestly it doesn't. Atropine can be used for bradycardia unresponsive to stimulation IV fluids and use pressors such as Epi for hypotension that's unresponsive to fluids. Iron's testable. The severity of iron poisoning correlates with the amount of elemental iron ingested. Less than 20 mg per kg, mild or no symptoms. 40 to 60 can cause moderate toxicity and greater than 60 per kilo is potentially severe. The serum iron level does not correlate with severity though. So the four to six hour post ingestion level or eight hours for sustained release, uh, greater than 40 mg per kg uh, should be worrisome. Non-toxic is less than 350, 350 to 500 mild to moderate symptoms and greater than 500 can produce serious toxicity. TIBC measurements, not helpful. You can see elevated white blood cell counts and hyperglycemia, but that's non-specific. The initial GI stage of iron toxicity is from 30 minutes to six hours, which is from corrosive damage, nausea, vomiting, hematemesis. Relatively stable patients are seen in six to 24 hour range. No symptoms at all, or maybe a little bit of hyperventilation or altered perfusion. Systemic toxicity is seen at six to 72 hours. This is where you get hypovolemic shock and cardiovascular collapse. Severe metabolic acidosis, hepatic failure, and jaundice. You get coagulation disruption, which worsens GI bleeding, and patients can go into a coma. GI pyloric scarring occurs two to six weeks post-ingestion. In serotonin syndrome, 
you'll see patients on SSRIs, MAOIs, fentanyl, and even ecstasy. Linazolid and tramadol can cause it. Fever, confusion, sweating, and myoclonus. Myoclonus is a big one. Effective treatment for dystonic reaction or serotonin syndrome can be diphenhydramine, bentropine, um, or you know other medicines. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, hyperthermia, muscle rigidity, confusion, autonomic instability. You get full pipe lead body rigidity that helps differentiate it from dystonic reactions. Data on dantrolene and bromocryptine is lacking, so treatment is mostly supportive. The oral hypoglycemics are in the one pill can kill class. Glipizide and gliburide always admit these patients and check glucoses. Metformin is less potent but could cause a lactic acidosis. Met hemoglobinemia is seen in patients exposed to nitrates, uh, topical lidocaine like Orogel and well water. Chocolate brown blood, there's a saturation gap between the peripheral O2 sat and the ABG. So you have a normal PaO2 but a pulse ox of 88. Get a coax. Carbon monoxide is flu-like symptoms that affect the whole household. Carboxyhemoglobin level greater than 15 to 20 is generally symptomatic. Treat coma or severe neurologic or cardiac complications with hyperbaric therapy if available. Otherwise, 100% O2. Remember that the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin is 60 minutes on 100% O2 versus four to five hours on room air. Cyanide interferes with the mitochondria, which I have been told is the powerhouse of the cell. You see cyanide poisoning in a house fire because it's leached from burning materials like curtains and couches. Treatment is the cyano kit, which is hydroxycobalamin. It can also happen with nitroprusside treatment for blood pressure. For caustic substance ingestion, do not induce vomiting. Patients get a scope for serious ingestion. As acids are less dangerous than alkali. Household bleach is just an irritant, but lye, drain cleaner, oven cleaner can cause liquefactive necrosis and then strictures later on. Acids include toilet bowl cleaner, grout cleaner, rust remover, automotive, battery liquids, muriatic acid for swimming pools, and metal cleaners like gun bluing. These lead to coagulation necrosis, more superficial, uh, and less severe or deep, thick eschar formation, uh, metabolic acidosis, or acute renal failure. Hydrocarbons like mineral oil and tiki lamp oil uh, include, are included in the monic champ. So camphor, halogenated compounds, aromatics, metal like arsenic and mercury, or pesticides. It can cause aspiration pneumonitis. They can also cause arrhythmias like in huffing. Know the alcohols. They're gonna show up on the boards or maybe after the boards when you're celebrating. You'll see a high osmolal gap. Ethanol, methanol, and ethylene glycol cause a high anion gap, but isopropyl alcohol does not. Remember, first time drinkers of ethanol have zero order metabolism, so they will metabolize at 10 milligram per deciliter per hour. Methanol <clears throat> is contained in windshield washer fluid. It's metabolized to formic acid and causes blindness. So alcohol ingestion with a kid who has vision complaints, think methanol. Abdominal pain and metabolic acidosis without lactic acidosis or ketonuria are also seen. You treat with bicarb, femepazole, and folate. Ethylene glycol is seen on antifreeze. You'll get kidney injury 24 to 72 hours later. The urine can fluoresce with a woods lamp, though that's pretty darn nonspecific. Treat with bicarb, femepazole, and pyridoxine. <coughs> All right, let's talk about a few toxic plants. So digitalis effects occur in a number of plants. These are dysrhythmias by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase pump, increasing intracellular calcium. You'll see atria tachycardia, uh, AV block, nausea and vomiting, and visual changes. So the foxglove, lily of the valley, and oleander are all examples of digitalis effect causing plants. Atropine-like plants, gymsum weed and deadly nightshade. Cyanide-like effects are seen in pear and apple seeds, peach pit, and bitter almond. Liver toxicity, amatoxin containing mushrooms, which provoke symptoms greater than six hours after ingestion. Oral pain due to Diffenbachia and Philodendron, and mild GI upset is seen with poinsettia, mistletoe, and holly. Merry Christmas. So for GI foreign bodies, know that coins are number one. 35% of foreign bodies are asymptomatic. Upper esophageal sphincter, the cricopharyngeus muscle, is where 70% gets stuck, 15% behind the aortic arch, and 15% at the lower esophageal sphincter. Remove coins if they're lodged in the esophagus within 12 to 24 hours. A button battery should be removed within four hours. Greater than two magnets ingested could lead to perforation because they stick together across bowel lumens. 
and now bite stings and envenomations. So mammalian bites, antibiotics can reduce the risk of infection to the hand, face, and genitals. And generally, they're a good idea. For cats, remember, pasturella, uh, multiceta, puncture wounds can inoculate deep into the tendon sheath. Dogs macerate. Suit your face and hands if there's cosmetic concerns. The rabies vaccine is generally not needed. Human bites, beware of the danger of the fight bite. That's a bite on the knuckle that inoculates bacteria from the mouth deep into the hand. Rabies, worry about raccoons, skunks, bats, foxes, and coyotes. In the US, greater than 95% of snake bites are the crotalidae, so the pit vipers, including the rattlesnakes, water moccasin, and copperheads. You get local tissue injury, compartment syndrome, coagulopathy, and neurotoxicity. Don't apply pressure, ice or a tourniquet. Don't use excision. Don't suck out the venom. Use Crofab antivenom within six hours if you can. Treat patients who have coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, systemic toxicity, significant edema, crossing a joint. The other 5% of snake bites in the U.S. are the elapidae. That's the coral snakes. So red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom lack. Minimal local reactions with prominent neurotoxicity are seen. Treatment is symptomatic with species-specific antivenom. Testable spider bites include the brown recluse. This is a spider that has a dark violin pattern on the dorsum. Cutaneous loxalism leads to a deep ulcer formation that takes a long time to heal. The black widow, in addition to being a member of the Avengers, has a ventral red hourglass on the abdomen. The venom is a neurotoxin. And the initial signs and symptoms include a little bit of pain at the site, but also diaphoresis, muscle cramping, chest tightness, vomiting, malaise, and sweating, and know that a black widow bite can mimic the pain of acute appendicitis.